the way you directed this with me. Uh, we're both teachers here at Washburn. And, um, so we did this like sort of last minute. This is a competition. There's a Minnesota State High School League contest, which is weird for theater. I mean, like when you, yeah. But competitive theater is weird, but <laughs> it's a good chance to do really interesting work and something that challenges the actors. And the show can be no more than 35 minutes. It's time. I told the cast today, you don't have to worry so much about, you know, it'll still be 35 minutes. But, um, so it's, it's nice that we can do it for an audience. Thank you guys. This is a play by Rowena Malik, who is uh, a playwright in Chicago. She did it as a one-woman show, so we took these five characters, these are all true stories, and she created a one-woman show, and she does these five different characters. Um, and uh, she's a um, Muslim-American woman, and she has an amazing story herself, but we decided, I sort of went out on a limb that we would get people to audition, um, because we, it's nothing personal, white girls, so but we couldn't use you in the show. <laughs> and um, and you know it's it's we're trying to to make theater less. It's a very segregated place for some reason. And um, I asked one of my actresses about why that was, and she said, "When you, when you grow up, and um, I'm so emotional. I love these girls so much." Um, so when you when you look at TV. And all you see are white women. You never think you could do it. So. This is them. Most of them have never been on a stage before. So this is all new. But I just thought it was an important story. And so um, there's going to be a little talk back if you want to ask the girls questions. But um, there's some great information in the program. And in the back, there's the English um, Learning Center, which I volunteered this summer. The director, Jenny Nelson, is here. It's an amazing organization. Volunteer, give money. And in fact, Nancy Lee, the choir director, and her husband, Hans, helped start that when they were pastors of that church 25 years ago. So it was a great connection to Washburn as well. So, um, so please enjoy the show, and, um, and we'll have a little discussion afterwards if you can stay. So thanks so much for coming. She told me that while laboring me in the hospital, 
She kept reciting the chapter in the Quran, named after the Virgin Mary. Surah Al-Maryam. This chapter talks about Mary's birth with Jesus, and scholars recommend pregnant women to read it because of the blessing. I guess seeing the cover made her feel like part of her prayers were answered. What was I telling you? <laughs> oh yes, Lina's letter. I had beautiful men down my hand, and I was running really late. I grabbed my sticks. You see, we have this dance called the Dandaya, where you take two sticks and smash them together. It's beautiful. I put the kids in the car and called my husband, who was still at work. I told him to hurry up, or he'd miss the ceiling with the green shoes. When I reached the hall, the parking lot was full. There were two weddings taking place in the bank, our Pakistani wedding and an American wedding. Finally, I found a spot. Grabbed a double stroller, put the kids in, and headed towards the entrance. I was so excited, I kept thinking about Nina, wondering how she'd look in the dress that was behind her. It really was my best work. As I headed towards the entrance, I noticed a man smoking a cigarette with his lady friend. So I'm pushing my double stroller and walk past him when he says, Take that shit off your head. I froze. I couldn't move. My brain was trying to process what just happened. I remember asking myself, did he just say that to me? I turned around and he was glaring at me. I remember thinking he might just be drunk, so I decided to ignore him and walk away. As I was walking away, he started laughing with his lady friend. Maybe it was his laughter, but I stopped. In that moment, I realize everything I do, my children will do. If I let people treat me like garbage, they'll grow up doing the same. <clears throat> so I turned around, looked him in the eye, and said, Sir, you need to get an education because you're ignorant. You're in America. Take that shit off your head. That's right, I'm in America, where I have my constitutional rights to practice my religion and dress how I like. You Muslims are all terrorists. Go back to Afghanistan. Sir, let me educate you. Afghanis are not Arabs. I am not an Afghani or an Arab or a terrorist. I am an American, a Pakistani American. If you're American, then dress like one. I am dressed like one. You people are crazy. Paradise, right? You want a paradise kill all non-Muslims. I told him he was wrong. I told him we believe paradise lies in so honor and respect mothers. I told him what he just said to me was really ignorant. Don't call me stupid! He charged towards me with his fists getting closer and closer to my face when just in time his lady friend yelled, John, no, she's not worth it! I spent most of my best friend's wedding at the police station. I missed the stealing of the blue shoes. I missed everything that was important to me. This man, John, thought it was okay to swear at me in front of my children. He thought it was okay to physically attack me in front of my children. That's because in his eyes, I was not a wife, a mother, a daughter. I was just a Muslim, a terrorist. I was not human. Do you know what it feels like for you and your children to be treated like you're not human? I do. I haven't been able to design wedding dresses since that day. I just can't. And I didn't want Nina to find out. After all, it was her wedding day. I wanted all the attention to be on her, but she found out. Everybody found out. Nina hugged me, handed me my Dendaya sticks, and asked me to dance with her. I looked at her like she was crazy. How can I dance? I should have just ignored him. What if he hit me in front of my children? They would have been traumatized for the rest of their lives. Nina said, dance with me. I refused. Then she recited a verse from the Holy Quran. So verily, with hardship comes ease. Verily, with hardship comes ease. Her words mended my broken heart. You see, I just love designing wedding dresses. I just do. And I can't believe I let that day stop me from doing what I love. I mean, after all, everything you do, your children will do.
really something. The most important thing we can do to honor this day is to remember it. People do strange things to remember. Some people fly on this day, other people go right to the top of the skyscraper. I read in the Dallas News about this group of local women who every year on this day fly Dallas to Chicago, go right to the top of the Sears Tower. It's their way to remember, their way of saying, I will not let fear cripple me. You want to know how I remember? I drink kapha say. I pray, read Quran for those who died, and then I take my walk. My husband would prefer me to stay home. He's worried some fool might do something to me, but I told him you have to be strong in life. My grandma raised me to be tough. I can still hear her voice. Inez, you better learn to be tough because you were born with two strikes against you. You're black and you're female. When I turned 21 and I told my grandma I reverted to Islam, she just rolled her eyes and said, strike three. <laughs> You heard me correctly, honey. I said revert. No, I'm not a convert. I'm a revert. No, it's not the same thing. I don't care if your community says convert. Your community has got it wrong. Look, the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, taught us that every newborn is born to Islam. No, I don't mean newborns pray five times a day and fast at Ramadan. Don't be foolish. But every newborn is born into a state of submission, and that's what Islam is submission to God's will. And in reality, we're all dependent on God to survive. Therefore, I've reverted to my original state. Don't call me a convert, honey. I'm a revert. The first time I drank Kafla Sade was at a funeral. It's bitter, extremely bitter, like death. I drank Kafla Sade to remember that extremely bitter day. So many people died, too many. It was a beautiful day and I was running some errands. When I entered the store, everyone was gathered around the owner's television. We all watched. Lord have mercy, what's wrong with humanity? The store owner, Jim, who I have known for years, said, we need to bomb those Arabs back to the Stone Ages. Everyone turned and looked at me. I saw this man staring at me. He took his finger and went like this. Gotta get out of there. I wasn't scared of him, but being a mother changes everything. I walked away from him because all I wanted to do was protect my baby. I walked one block and everyone was glaring at me. This woman came right up to me and touched my hijab. She said, Sweetie, take that off. It's not safe to wear that right now. I thought she's crazy. I've been wearing my hijab since the day I took my shahada. It's a part of me. But the looks on people's faces sent chills my spine. And that's when I did it. I took it off in front of everyone. I ran home. I was crying. I felt like a coward. I kept asking Allah to forgive me for being so weak. A few days later, we heard about this Sikh man in Arizona who just because of his turban and beard was murdered by a man who called himself a patriot. My husband said, see, you made the right decision. That could have been you. I give myself enough grief about taking it off. I don't need you laying it on me, too. That day was surreal. And one day, I felt like our rights, our rights as Americans, were stolen from us by our fellow Americans. I took my job off so that I would look American. But that was un-American. I should have never had to make that decision. Not in this country. Not in the land of the free, home of the brave, my country. And don't you think that this is just a Muslim problem or an Arab problem. This is every American's problem. We are all Americans and we need to protect each other. We all need to realize, today it's my rights. Tomorrow it could be yours. Not cut. And it's garnished with lots of 
taking classes at the local community college. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. One day, I came home from school, and my father's friend said Hassan was visiting us. I knew exactly why Hassan had come, and I was not happy about it. Instead of sugar, I wanted to put salt in Hassan's tea to let his taste buds know I'm not interested. <laughs> Finally, Hassan went home, and my mama had a little chat with me. I had to explain to her that I didn't like Hassan in that way, and I was in love with Joel, an American boy I had met at school. I was walking down the hall towards class one day, and there was a group of boys following me. They were calling me a towel head. One even tried to pull off my hijab, he almost pulled it off. I tried not to cry, but I couldn't stop the tears. I saw this boy watching, and when he started to walk up to them, I assumed he was friends with them and he was gonna join in. But instead, he grabbed one of the boys and warned all of them if they ever bothered me again, he'd beat them up. <coughs> he told me his name was Joe. He even spoke to me in Arabic. He said, Meh, and I said, no. He knew that my name means light. He told me he converted to Islam. I asked him why, and he said he was in a very serious car accident. It's a miracle that I survived. I really should be dead. That's where my journey began. I studied all religions after the crash. The Islamic creed in particular stood out to me. No God but God. I thought about the things we worship today. Fame, money, stuff. In a dark world, no God but God is life. A year later, I took my shahada at the mosque. I would see him around school. He'd say hello and chat with me. He's a musician. He's studying the road. One time, I asked him to play for me, and he did. As he played, I thought, this is it. This is what it feels like to fall in love. When my parents met Joe, they loved him. We were married, and I was so happy I finally started my life with my soulmate. One month later, Joe had his first film concert. He was wearing the jalebi I bought him from Morocco. It's a long garb, garb Arab men wear. He looked beautiful. It was Friday evening <coughs> as I drove into the college parking lot. I had planned to meet with Joe there to make sure I got into the building safely. But as I got out of the car, Joe wasn't there. I heard a scream behind the building. I went to see what it was. There was a group of boys beating up Joe. When he saw me, he screamed. Run! I tried to run as fast as I could, but three of the boys grabbed me and pulled me behind the building where Joe was. Two of them pinned me to the ground, and somebody punched me in the face. They had knives. One of them said, who wants to go first? I screamed and begged them to stop, but they kept saying, no mercy for terrorists. I let my soul connect to Allah, and I kept saying, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no power or strength except with God. I heard a siren. All the boys ran. I thought everything was going to be okay until I saw Joe. He had been stabbed several times. I tried, tried pushing my hands on the wound to stop the blood, but it was too much. He was whispering something. I put my ear close to his lips to hear what he was saying. I bet you think he was saying my name. He wasn't. He was saying God's name over and over again. You see, in the last moments of your life, whatever's in your heart comes out. Nothing else. Joe started to moan, and he whispered the shahada. That was the last thing he ever said. For a long time, I locked myself in my bedroom in deep depression. I would just sit there and scream, why me? Then, one night, I experienced it head. The inspiration from the divine. I saw Joe. He said, A dark world needs light, and you are nor. You are light. The next day, I finally left my bedroom. 
I met with state's attorneys that fight against hate crime. I met other victims. I started to feel less alone. Slowly, I began to heal. I thought about my mother's words. Instead of asking why me, ask what for. When I graduated from law school, my parents were so proud. I will give to you the same advice my mother gave me. Your words, they have power. Silence is sometimes a crime. I will never forget Joe. It's because of him I found my purpose in life. He made me see God in everything. Yalla, let's drink the tea. Let's drink it with lots of sugar. You have tasted the bitterness of evil. Now, taste the sweetness of hope.
people always talking about veils and oppression. Well, I know what real oppression is, and it's called racism. See, I come from a colonized people. And when the British left India, they never really left. They left behind their racist mentality, and we ate it up. And it keeps getting passed down generation to generation. Daughters taught to hate their brown skin. But the cycle, it ends with me. I can hear my friends screaming, Layla, come back. 
Bro, let's go near them. But I keep walking. I grabbed that boy. His eyes looked like a wild animal. My body was shaking. Is this the solution? Is this helping the people of New York? Do not call me a terrorist. I am not a terrorist. Listen to me. Murder is haram. I don't ask my brother. Is, I don't know. He lives in New York. I don't know if he's alive or dead. Don't spit at me. Murder is haram. It is forbidden. This is not Islam. Get to know me. Get to know my community. My name is Layla. Get to know me. You see, I wear a veil on my head, but my heart is not covered. Remove the veil from your heart and you will realize that we are one. No, officer! Do not arrest him! This hatred and anger must end here! Let him go! The boy's eyes changed. They looked human. I pray to Allah. I pray to Allah for that boy to make his heart Unveiled. I will never see my brother Kareem again. His co worker said because of his medical training, he went into the towers to help. There was no body to bury. Sometimes I pretend he is alive and will knock on my door to surprise me. Some in the Zuri once, he said, God is really. He loves beautiful things. We are on this earth for but a few moments. We are only one people, Layla. Spread the peace. So my friends, that was the day when I found the meaning and the power of my name. It's a quiet power, but do not be fooled. It is stronger than hate and violence. It is the power of mercy, love, and forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> Where are my parents? Oh, no. oh. You 
Easter I asked me, she, we were talking just about, and she'll, you know, people like, you know, because this is how, you know, she dresses every day. And though she'll be in Kowalski, she, and they'll, she said it was every time, she goes, where are you from? She goes, South Minneapolis. <laughs> she goes, no, like, where are your parents from? She goes, South Minneapolis. <laughs> it's been interesting. Those conversations have been really interesting. Any other questions? Yes, question. Kristen. Hi, ladies. Good job. Congratulations. I'm curious to know what was the most challenging part of this? Maybe for each one of you, whoever wants to talk. So what was the biggest challenge? And what was your like favorite part about this experience? And speak up so we can hear you. Use your theater voice. The greatest challenge was just like spreading these stories without like like these are true stories. So I don't want to like water them down or not give them justice enough. So it was really hard for me to know if I was giving them enough justice or not. Mm -hmm. um, the funnest part was just letting loose. I don't know. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I the my biggest fear or like the first time I got the script was. Like, am I really ready to tell the side of the story? Because everyone has a different story in this, and this is like different perspectives of different people's lives, and this has happened, parts of this happened to my life, parts of this has happened to one of our lives, and so when I like said the lines, I was scared that like I wouldn't have said it with enough power or something, so that was probably my biggest fear. Um, I love the line, USA, USA, go back to your country, here, because I sort of got, I hear that every single day. So, that was, like, saying that out loud made me feel like I just got, like, all that stress out, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the most difficult part for me was that I'm not from, like, I'm not Muslim, so I don't really understand as much as I could mm -hmm. um, the other girls in the show. So I think that was one thing that I was worried about, that I was, like, I wouldn't be able to portray this role well enough because I don't really know it. But uh, the best part was seeing people's reactions and seeing how much this meant to people. I kind of agree. Like it's really hard to like get in the role of someone that you're actually like not. Like <laughs> I'm not Pakistani. Like and like it's like it's really cool to like understand the culture, but it's like also hard to like you know get into that person's life and like putting yourself in the place of a mother with children that's like in the situation of being attacked. Mm -hmm. I would say the hardest part for me was uh, emotional because it gets very real. Like, and for every character, they have like a very strong moment um, in their scenes. And I don't know. I, I really enjoyed seeing all the other ladies just like really get into their character and like, telling the story going on the stage. It's amazing. I'm watching them on stage. It's great. We all come from different backgrounds, you know. Just because they they may dress, you know, Yusra was saying today, she's like. You know, the only thing we do the same is, is how we pray. That's the same. I was going to say the same. Because yeah. like, when I was reading my script out loud in the beginning, um, you know, Islam is a very good religion, you know? So um, there's a lot of Muslims out there, and they all speak different languages. Mm -hmm. And so Aisha, um, we have a different dialect. So basically, I was reading my script, and because I'm Somalian, it was different than the way that I speak. And so I was talking to her, I was practicing to her, telling her, this is the way I'm supposed to pronounce it, like telling me right now before I embarrass myself. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, one that will always say the same thing, really right? Because that all unites us, and that's why we ended it out that, that way, because that's, that's always gonna say the same for every single person out here. Anything else before we I want to thank you. You're so brave and you're telling really important stories. And I was immediately struck um, I had done your story at the beginning because the school that I work at has all adult students. And this situation that you portrayed literally happened yesterday in front of our school in South Minneapolis. Um, and that is the fourth woman that will help to report this story since the election. Um, this is really happening. And what you're Showing us is really great. I tell everyone if they would just go and spend 
a small amount of time. I mean, I was not, I only volunteered about three or four months and spending time with those adults, probably between like 40 and 70, all working 87 every night coming there to learn English. And I taught English one, which is a riot. I mean, we're talking charades, I say, and they laughed. It was the best. I'm like, if you would just volunteer and get involved, I just feel like it would solve so many problems. That's why I put that information on the back of the English Learning Center. So they do such great work. You give some time or money. Um, it's, it's so important. And it changed everything for me, and I, I wish everyone would. As Layla says, you know, get to know my community. Get to know me. Well, it's sad to think that they won't continue to tell the story. It's a very important one. You didn't move on, but you're really winners in our hearts, and I really wish. Yeah, we got all trained. You know, he's one of the I feel like not just, you know. We lost a you know, bunch of white people from Wyzetta. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and it was so interesting, two of the judges, out of the three judges, they were all, you know, older white people, like out of Nod or something. <laughs> don't consider myself that at all. And um, and two of the three judges, I mean, after seeing the show, knowing exactly what it's about, you know, we're like, we really liked your costumes. Because <laughs> most, they got these from home, you know. Um, and I know they didn't mean anything by it, but it was just, it just, I didn't like that. Like, that's how you're looking at this. I mean, this is, you know, if I got up there wearing this because I was playing a middle-aged white guy, people aren't going to call this my costume. They'd be like, oh, your street clothes or whatever, you know, what, just say it, you know. It's just have some sensitivity to culture, and that's what we all need to learn from this, I guess. Huh? But, so I think we're going to do this again maybe in school um, for some of the classes. We just feel it's pretty important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so, do you ever want us to perform it, do you think? Well, John Oden's probably asking hundreds, dozens, hundreds, one actually. I can't imagine. Yeah, I know, yeah. You can come out for white schools. Yeah. Inform us all what this is all about. Yeah. The other, so the other place, too, where it was all, like almost all the shows were, there's a lot of like abuse toward women, and like literally. And it was just like, but we, I mean, at this point, you know, you can't, but the people that came up afterwards, all night long to these girls. And, you know, the woman who ran Minnesota State High School, they came up to me in tears and said, thank you, you know. She couldn't say much more than that because she's part of it, but, you know, they did. That's the important thing, you know. But, um, but I'm proud of my hope they continue. Yeah. So going with that, would you be interested in going to other schools? And performing the piece? Absolutely. In the beginning, I was talking to you about how I'm doing this for the impact of like me performing this. It's just I wanted I wanted to like do this. I wanted to hear your guys' perspective and just like I wanted to get my impact across. Like I wanted to make sure that my message like came through to you guys and like you guys like were there and that was it. So I would be glad to perform to other people because this is this is everything. Can you invite us to Hillmer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look, we already booked. <laughs> <laughs> Girls are taking on the road. Girls <laughs> <laughs> where's the yes. <laughs> And where's our white boy? He <laughs> 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 was so great. <laughs> He's ashamed of who he is. <laughs> so first of all, I'd like to thank you all for getting my kids to stand up here and represent themselves. This is our first time in the district. So yeah. it's amazing. And we the, two, the two sisters here. Yeah, we, 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 my husband moved a lot. So from Virginia to Seattle to California to different places. Well, sometimes in there are some places that you cannot really get. You have to move on because of people's reaction. But you know, but you my kids, we, we moved to La Crosse, Wisconsin. So we lived in Alaska for a while. So in the beginning, I, my kids were the only ones in the school. So I, I used to go to volunteer a lot. So my kids feel comfortable like, <laughs> for themselves. But being in Minneapolis and being around all and giving my kids the chance to stand up here and present this piece, I'm really congratulating Minneapolis 
Baba Kasusule also wash him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys, for, for sharing this with us. It meant a lot for us for you guys to be here. I know it's kind of a last minute thing, so we'll, um, hey, if we do some more, we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted. Yeah, yeah. But feel free to say hi to the girls and congratulate them. And thank you so much.